Manhattan Island. Today, with its towering skyscrapers, it would have looked so different to those early settlers who came to these shores. This story is about a missionary called David Brainerd, who would spread the liberty of the gospel to the native inhabitants of these shores. He would die early, but in a short space of time he would leave a legacy for mission and be an inspiration to generations of Christians. The story of David Brainerd's life would become well known because of two important factors. Brainerd kept a diary of his life, and Jonathan Edwards, a key figure during the First Great Awakening, looked after David Brainerd during his final days of suffering from tuberculosis. Edwards, noting the significance of what Brainerd had done in his short years, published Brainerd's diary, which became well read and an encouragement to believers everywhere. During the early 1700s, the frontiers were still being forged. There were 13 established colonies still under British rule. For the Native American Indians, it was an uncertain time as they faced the influx of settlers. Settlers want land, and there's a lot of problems over the land transactions because Native people knew nothing about fee simple, about individual ownership of land. Land was given to a tribe by the Creator, and uh, the tribal people used that land. And when certain members weren't using one part of it, another member could use it, but nobody owned the land. So what happens is when, for example, inland people would often come to the coast to do fishing. Uh, of course, there were people living on the coast, so what they had to do was they would pay tribute. The coastal people would allow them to stay there for a couple of weeks and fish. And so the original land transactions here, uh, this is probably what Native people thought they were doing. So you have a lot of problems there. And of course, one of the major problems is disease. European diseases uh, decimated uh, people here. There are some estimates that 90% of the population, Native population in Southern New England uh, was killed off by European diseases by 1650. That's a tremendous amount. By the 17-teens, New England is actually emerging out of a time of prolonged warfare. Not only do you have King Philip's War in 1675, 1676, you also have a series of imperial wars with France and uh, her Indian allies, and King William's War, Queen Anne's War. And so by the time you hit the 17-teens, actually things are beginning to stabilize. There is um, a resumption of, of immigration, and also you have the em emergence of a, a really robust Atlantic world trade that is going on too. And so Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts are continually being integrated into this wider world of trade. David Brainerd was born in the colony of Connecticut in 1718 in a town called Haddam on the Connecticut River. He was the sixth of nine children born to Hezekiah and Dorothy Brainerd. The best knowledge we have of Brainerd's family background suggests that his grandfather came to the colonies at the age of about 12 as an indentured servant. And then when he reached the age of 21, uh, he was part of a group of men who settled the new town of Haddam. He and his wife had a number of children, uh, one of them, the youngest son, uh, Hezekiah Brainerd, who was David Brainerd's father, uh, became very wealthy, uh, very politically connected. His uh, father served numerous terms in the Connecticut legislature. He was on the governor's council. He was Speaker of the House of Connecticut in several occasions. Uh, in addition to his land, uh, there's pretty good evidence that he ran a fairly successful merchant business from his home. His home life, early on, he was educated uh, by his parents and at home. And children would be regularly taught not just Latin, not just grammar, but the catechism. And they were expected to know uh, the basics of Christian doctrine so that when they heard the minister on Sunday preach, say on the doctrine of justification, 
uh, he wouldn't have to take time to explain what that was. The, the families and would know what that is because they had been catechized. Brainerd was part of a New England world that was still very much influenced by the legacy of the Puritans, these forefathers who'd come in the 17th century and whose impact, not only religiously but politically, on the colony was very, very strong. David's parents died early on in his life, first his father, then his mother. He went to live with his sister Jerusha, who married a farmer from East Haddam. When David reached 19, he tried farming, as he had inherited a farm from his father in nearby Durham. This didn't last long. In 1739, he goes through a conversion process, and in that same year, he enrolls at Yale. As Brainerd made his way to Yale, it's perhaps helpful just to try to describe Yale at that particular time. It had been founded in the early 1700s as a alternative, you might say, to Harvard College. Harvard was perceived by some New Englanders as having become too theologically liberal. We think of those early colonial colleges especially geared towards the training of ministers, and Yale was certainly that. And yet I think Brainerd went not quite sure what his path was going to be in the future. When David Brainerd got to Yale in September 1739, he was treated like many of uh, his other fellow classmates as uh, incoming freshmen. And there's hazing and other things that were involved. The average age of an incoming student at Yale would have been 15, 16. He was considerably older than the average freshman. And so I can sort of imagine Brainerd having to say to a 16-year-old, you know, can I shine your shoes or, you know, can I walk up the stairwell? And I, I think that would have graded a lot with him. Uh, he did get sick his first year. He went back in his, what would have been his sophomore year, got sick again. Uh, he this time refers to it as a mild upset, but he also reports that he was spitting blood. He came back to college uh, and with another man named David Youngs, who had eventually also become a revivalist. They, as Brain had said, we got together determined to do something about the spiritual condition of the college. And there was no real plan because about a month after they started meeting for this purpose, the great revival, the great awakening hit Yale. One of the most important religious developments within the first half of the 18th century in colonial America was what has come to be called the Great Awakening or the First Great Awakening. It really refers to a series or wave of revivals that began as early as the 1720s, first in individual congregations in places like New Jersey, then in the 1730s in Massachusetts, and then from the late 30s into the 40s up and down the eastern seaboard, but especially in New England. Edwards is serving as a minister in Northampton and Massachusetts in the 1730s. He inherits this church from his grandfather, Solomon Stoddard. And in 1734, 1735, uh, after a period of extraordinary dullness, as Edwards would describe it, um, there is a series of events that leads to a more widespread revival of religion. And so this revival breaks out in Northampton. And in Jonathan Edwards' own description of it, it transforms the entire town. What's fascinating is that this then becomes a model for other towns and other ministers around New England, but also in uh, parts of the British Isles as well. This is partly because Edwards publishes a report of the awakening in Northampton in 1737 as uh, a faithful narrative of the surprising works of God. This book sold and was read in the colonies, but it was very influential with a couple of guys in England named John Wesley and George Whitfield, uh, who saw this as the, the beginning of God's awakening as people. Whitfield began preaching outdoors in England, became an instant hit. Uh, as some historians have quite rightly argued, one of the first great celebrities. I mean, the reception for Whitfield when he turned up in the colonies was like, like what rock stars or sporting heroes get today. I mean, the newspapers reported, you know, he's here, now he's on the ship, we believe he's on the way, he's arrived in Philadelphia, he's on his way to Boston. It was just very exciting for people. And Whitfield preached to hundreds, if not thousands of people in outdoor settings. Uh, when he preached in Philadelphia, Benjamin Franklin was in the audience and he estimated that perhaps 20,000 people were there to hear Whitfield preach. Uh, so this, these are large, large crowds. And it becomes known as great largely because of its geographical spread and the impact that it'll have on the spiritual tone of the colonies. But it'll also have ripple effects politically, socially, economically across colonial America for decades to come. 
As the First Great Awakening was spreading across New England, it came to New Haven and it came to Yale College, causing great upheaval. Thomas Clapp, uh, who was the rector of Yale, had welcomed Whitfield. He wanted to see renewal of religion, but he had reservations. And the more Whitfield preached, the more reservations Clapp had. And when Whitfield came back the second time, he wouldn't let him preach on the campus. Uh, and by this point in time, the zealots on the campus, which included Brainerd Youngs, another guy named Samuel Hopkins, and several others, had decided that Clapp was, was standing in the way of what God was doing. And the students themselves were looking at the faculty members and thinking, our own faculty are, are very cold and dry, and, and they were even wondering if many of them were converted. And so you could see this great divide taking place. And so Yale becomes a hotbed. Uh, Gilbert Tennant comes here, Ebenezer Pemberton preaches there, uh, and these guys are real sort of firebrands at the time. Most of them calm down uh, two or three years later, but at the time they're really pushing the envelope. So Brainerd uh, is involved in this, and of course, the problem with understanding what happens with Brainerd is that the whole story of his expulsion is, is destroyed from his diaries. And so the story of Brainerd's expulsion is Edward's story of Brainerd's expulsion, which is at one point after a chapel service, in a private conversation with two other students, Brainerd referred to one of the tutors at Yale, a guy named Chauncey Wittesley, and said he has no more grace in this chair, thus implying that Wittesley was not truly converted. Someone overheard this, they reported it to the rector because they passed a rule saying you couldn't criticize the college faculty. Uh, the rector hauled Brainerd up before him, demanded that he apologize in front of the whole college. Uh, Brainerd said, I won't do that because it was a private sin and should require a private confession. And when he refused to do a public uh, confession, he was expelled. We know from a later statement of Brainerd's that he'd attended illegal meetings on more than one occasion despite the college rules saying he shouldn't have. There are other documents out there, diaries of other students, notations and letters. Brainerd was a troublemaker. So I think really what had happened was that Brainerd had been neck deep in the revivals. He'd been very critical of the administration. He'd broken a lot of rules. And Clapp had finally caught him with a witness. I think this is what happened, that he probably suspected Brainerd was a troublemaker but didn't have any evidence, and now he had. As Brainerd began to consider his options following his expulsion from Yale, he encountered the divisions produced by the Great Awakening, both in New England and the Middle Colonies. In New England, folks divided into new lights and old lights, pro and anti-revival factions. In the middle colonies, particularly among Presbyterians, similarly they became known as the new sides and the old sides. Those Presbyterians favoring the awakening and some of its methods and tactics became known as the Presbyterian new side. By the spring of 1742, Brainerd uh, had left New Haven and he was living in a small town called Ripton in Connecticut, uh, studying under the local minister. During this time, he was able to meet a number of ministers in this new light movement. These were ministers uh, Bellamy and Jonathan Dickinson, a famous Presbyterian minister who had had an enormous impact on David Brainerd. And uh, during the spring of 1742 and into that summer, he wanted to be licensed to preach. So Brainerd had the option of being licensed by a local association as a preacher. Couldn't be a minister because he wasn't ordained, but he could preach. Uh, and he actually got connected with a group known as the Fairfield East Association. And so this was kind of a backdoor way into not necessarily becoming the minister of a church, but becoming a preacher. And so he's actually doing a lot of traveling and a lot of teaching in this period. Brainerd was presented with the possibility of becoming a missionary to Native Americans by the Presbytery of New York, and specifically by a pastor by the name of Ebenezer Pemberton, who was a commissioner of the SSPCK. The Scottish Society for the Propagation of Christian Knowledge was founded in Scotland, as you might expect, uh, in the first decade of the 18th century. And the focus really initially was to evangelize the Scottish Highlanders. But what's intriguing is by the 1730s, you have people in Scotland who are aware of the missionary activity among Native Americans and who begin to see another mission field that is parallel to the Scottish Highlanders. This was a pretty big move because uh, he was probably 
the fifth or sixth man in the New England colonies to ever contemplate becoming a full-time minister to Indians. So it was a pretty new process at this point in time. They originally had wanted him to go to Pennsylvania. It was the winter and there was some, a little bit of unrest on the Pennsylvania borderlands. And so they actually had him uh, be a assistant minister in East Hampton on Long Island for six weeks. Uh, and so he spent six weeks out there. But he also had the chance to meet with another guy named Azariah Horton. And Horton was also working for the Scottish Society amongst the Montauk Indians at the east end of Long Island. And Brain had made several visits to Horton and so clearly got a little bit of a hint as to what, what missionary work was like. In many ways, the early 18th century represented what some historians have called a second wave of evangelization with regard to Native Americans. So if in the 17th century, you have John Eliot in Massachusetts, Thomas Mayhew in Martha's Vineyard, Richard Bourne down on Cape Cod, and there is a tremendous emphasis in the mid 17th century to evangelize these Native Americans, King Philip's War temporarily brings uh, that to a halt. King Philip's War in 1675, which really devastated Native communities, even those who remained neutral or actually sided with the English, uh, were detrimentally affected by the outcome of King Philip's War, which of course was that the English won the war. You get throngs of English coming in. Population is greatly outweighed to the advantage of the Europeans. You have Native leadership trying to find ways for their communities to survive and still maintain traditional culture. These are people who had uh, very successful, very ancient cultures and, and religious and social systems. So they're looking for survival strategies. And one of those major survival strategies is Christianity. There is this dialectic that the early 18th century kind of holds out that there's a renewed emphasis to evangelize, but there's also a renewed interest on native parts as well within native communities. It has nothing to do with religion at the beginning. Christianity provides ministers who are white authority figures. Ministers are anti-alcohol, and so it keeps the uh, alcohol peddlers from bringing that in and causing destruction. Ministers also usually set up a school, which Native leadership very much wanted. In fact, we, we see in the petitions uh, to the General Assembly, Native leadership asking for ministers and schools to come to their areas because with schools, they teach English. You'll be able to read English. So that the next generation coming up will be better equipped to handle the structures and documents and mechanisms of empire, of colonialism. And what's interesting, I think, to observe is the way in which this educational effort then actually does open up more opportunity in terms of missionary activity because the educational curriculum is so religiously infused. But also, uh, that kind of exposure to Christianity actually makes participation in the first Great Awakening of the 1730s and 1740s a little more um, logical or natural somehow. It's not quite as jarring for natives to take place in revivals. The Great Awakening, New Lights, whatever you want to call them, they were much more evangelical. Native people liked this, they, they could understand this because Native religions were very evangelical, um, very uh, individualistic, people um, had visions, people talked about blood, blood was, was up. In fact, Native people used metaphors all the time. So when these itinerant ministers come into town, they come into New London, uh, James Davenport, Gilbert Tennant, even George Whitfield, Natives come to hear them because it's a spectacle. It's something different. It's something that they want to be a part of. They're interested in it. It's a new form of Christianity that they haven't been exposed to before. Even before the First Great Awakening, there is a small trickle in a lot of the churches in southeastern New England of servants of individual people, native servants, who are being brought to church and brought forward for baptism, brought forward for church membership. This changes fairly dramatically in the First Great Awakening, where you find Native Americans themselves joining local white churches. They are often forced to sit in the back of churches or up in the balconies um, and put aside in separate spaces. 
Brainerd's first assignment was going to be amongst the Delaware Indians in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, the border area there. But in 1743, he's informed that that possibility is no longer viable because there's sufficient violence going on on the frontier that he's reassigned northward to a community in the region of Albany, New York, uh, just across the border from Massachusetts in an Indian village called Kanamik with a group of Mohican Indians. This was an actual uh, kind of outpost from a larger group of Mohicans who'd moved to Stockbridge, Massachusetts, where they were being served by a missionary, John Sargent. And it will be Sargent who requests an aid and assistant for this group of Indians living about 20 miles from Stockbridge. Sargent, he'd been a tutor at Yale College, very successful. He's actually ordained as the minister at Stockbridge with a responsibility to Native Americans in a ceremony that both the Stockbridge Indians uh, who were Mohicans, uh, and the colonial government jointly appoint him to that position. So there's a great deal of confidence in Sargent. He seems to do very well. And so Brainerd arrived there in 1743 and spent about a year there uh, ministering to the Native Americans in that region. Uh, he's clearly shocked when he gets there. Uh, this was a man who'd grown up in commercial towns and Yale, and this is really isolated. Friday, April the 1st. 1743. I rode to Quanamique, near 20 miles from Stockbridge, where the Indians live, with whom I am concerned, and there lodged on a little heap of straw. I was greatly exercised with inward trials and distresses all day, and in the evening my heart was sunk, and I seemed to have no God to go to. Lord's Day, April the 10th preached to the Indians both forenoon and afternoon. They behaved soberly in general. Two or three in particular appeared under some religious concern with whom I discoursed privately, and one told me her heart had cried ever since she heard me preach first. A number of days later he struggles with depression. Wednesday, April the 13th, my heart was overwhelmed within me. I verily thought I was the meanest, vilest, most helpless, guilty, ignorant, benighted creature living. And yet I knew what God had done for my soul. At the same time, though, sometimes I was assaulted with damping doubts and fears whether it was possible for such a wretch as I to be in a state of grace. He often wrote about being lonely in his journal. He would often relate his, his serious depression uh, in his journal as well. And you couple that with his, his struggle with tuberculosis, and it made many days uh, among the American Indians difficult at Kanamik. Uh, he would try to preach and feel so weak and uh, have regular sweats and fevers, and uh, this was difficult life. And he didn't know the language either. And so he had a, an interpreter that he called John, uh, his interpreter up there who would actually later become an interpreter of Jonathan Edwards. And there's a pretty good case to be made that this was an individual who was, as Edwards would put it later, was melancholic by nature. He was probably not a, a happy, you know, very bubbly person. And I think being in isolation probably made that worse for him. Brainerd uses the words melancholy and vapors frequently in his diary to describe what he is feeling. David Brainerd talks about vapors and talks about melancholy. In the 1700s, melancholy was a term that they used for depression. And going back to understanding it a little bit more, we have to go back to ancient Egyptian times in Mesopotamia, where the belief was that all the things were made up of four major elements, earth, air, fire, and water. And then Hippocrates, around 400 BC, used that kind of mentality to put together an understanding of the human body, saying the human body is made up of four main substances. They were called humors. So humorology or humorism came about, and that was sort of the understanding of medicine that these four, black bile, yellow bile, phlegm, and blood, needed to be in some kind of balance for our physical health and psychological health. And so if there's excessive black bile, that was called melancholy in males, but it was called vapors in females, with the idea that actual vapors were coming inside the body from that excessive black bile from their uterus up 
and sort of clouding their psychological abilities and the workings of the mind. I think as Brainerd initially talked about his struggles as melancholy, meaning that male version, which is more sort of sedentary, low key, uh, remorseful, pessimistic, doom and gloom. As his physical problems continued to escalate, there became a more physical expression of his uh, maladies, as well as a um, maybe a lesser tolerance for his struggles. So he might have become more flamboyant with his emotional expressions. So he started to refer to himself as having the vapors, which was more that female version of depression. I think it was because of the physical maladies he had and just the toll it was taking on him, gave him a more flamboyant expression of his physical struggle and his emotional struggle. What was the cause of this struggle? I mean, we still are having trouble sort of conceptualizing that even today, but taking a look back, um, you know, I think part of it was, as you read his diary, he was just a very sensitive, deep thinker. And I think there's people that are born genetically predisposed that their personality is a much more sensitive personality. So the ills of the world, both the ills that they experience as well as the people around them experience, really take a toll on them and trying to find out, well, what's fair? Um, what's worthy? Why do these things happen to people? Why is my friend sad? Why did my mother die when I was 14 and my father when I was nine? So some of the experiences that he had growing up certainly had a, a marked influence on him. Now at that time in the 1700s, they didn't look at psychological issues as sort of the composite of all the experiences and how we interpret those experiences as we do now. We looked at it as, well, I did something and now I'm getting a consequence that's why I have this adversity or that's why I have this depression or anger or uh, you know, maladaption to that particular situation. He lives with a Dutch family, uh, as he describes them. They don't speak English, he doesn't speak Dutch. But he also attempted to make a success. After a number of months, he actually built uh, what he called a hut uh, near the Native American settlement. He moved out of the Dutch family's home and built this small hut for himself much closer to the Native Americans, living fairly close to their settlement. While he's building the hut, he notes that he's actually living in one of their, their whether it was a tent or whether it was one of their huts, we're not sure. But he's actually living with an Indian family for a couple of weeks, which is a pretty remarkable thing for an 18th century Connecticut man to be doing. Uh, not the norm at all. So there was obviously a lot of give and take for him. He is very much uh, affected by the limited economic circumstances of the Indians there. And over time, he begins to become uh, convinced that he himself should give up more and more of his own material possessions. So one of the interesting features I think we need to recognize in Brainerd's own experience in Konamik as well as in years to come will be the ways in which his missionary experience and those who are working with him in essence are shaping him. Uh, he's not only there trying to change them in certain ways but he himself is being changed by the Indians with whom he is in contact. The village is getting fairly small. There are rumors of a new war with the French had actually broken out uh, in parts of Europe. And so Brainerd says, look, I think you guys should relocate down to Stockbridge, work with John Sargent. He's got a much bigger mission there, and that's basically what they do. And so he ends his ministry at Canyon Meek, and the society is ready for him to move to Pennsylvania at this point in time. In between the time that Brain had left Kanyameek and when he went to Pennsylvania, uh, there was an attempt to reconcile with Thomas Clapp at Yale. Uh, and Edwards mentions this briefly. We know that Aaron Burr was part of it. Jonathan Dickinson had been, they'd all been working on Brainerd's behalf. Uh, and the traditional story is that it really, the problem couldn't be solved. And yet that's actually contradictory within the diaries themselves because uh, Brainerd clearly wanted to have a degree. This was the big thing. He needed that degree to make his future stronger. And on the meeting with Clapp, that was actually offered to him. Clapp said, yes, you can come back to Yale, yes, you can have your degree, but you have to come back for a year. I think he didn't want to go back to Yale. I think he wanted the degree based on the work he'd done. He had done a lot of work since he'd left. He just didn't want to be a student again. By this point, he was, you know, 24, 25. Most of the students would have been 17 or 18. Yale probably didn't have happy memories for him. Uh, he, I don't think he just didn't want to go back there. Uh, so the reconciliation, you could say, was probably effective, but it didn't have any consequences for him in the end, so he never actually graduated from Yale. So he heads to a place called the Forks of the Delaware, a location in eastern Pennsylvania where Delaware Indians remained. 
When he gets there in 1744, he's pretty immediately disappointed to find that there are very few remaining Indians actually resident there. They are the last remnants of the Delaware and Muncie Indians who had lived there. But in the intervening years and intervening year, many of them had moved on further west into the Susquehanna Valley. The Forks of the Delaware, of course, is where the Lehigh River meets the Delaware River. This is all uh, major Lene Lenape sacred homelands. Lene Lenape means the people, the real people. That's their real name. That is their name for themselves. Uh, the English called them Delaware. So you go to the Forks of the Delaware, scattered settlements, there's no really concentrated group of Native Americans, and so his ministry would be traveling around the different villages. Shortly after he arrived there, he was now uh, fairly well connected with one of the Presbyterian factions in New Jersey and New York, people like Jonathan Dickinson, Ebenezer Pemberton again, who had this long association with. Basically what these, this group did in New Jersey and New York was simply ordain him as a minister, even without the degree, and they had the authority to do this because uh, there was no political involvement with the church in those colonies, so it was really up to the churches to run their own affairs. He builds a hut close to one of the Native American settlements, but because of the scattered nature of the Indian settlements, he does have to ride a lot uh, to visit them on a regular basis. The one significant thing that happened during his time at the Forks of the Delaware was the conversion of his interpreter, Moses Tatamy. Tatamy had long had contact with colonial people. Uh, he'd negotiated land sales with the governor. He'd actually had land taken from him under false auspices at one point. He also had been exposed to Christianity. We're not exactly sure how. He'd had interactions with the Moravians, but it's not entirely clear that this happened prior to Brainerd or after Brainerd. But the important thing was he had, to some extent, a spiritual vocabulary. And so, since he was interpreting, he didn't just have to interpret word for word, he could do concepts. And of course, this is something that if you're not used to dealing in different languages, escapes you. Tatami uh, ends up, at a time when Brainerd is away from the Forks of Delaware on a visit back uh, to New York, uh, Tatami later tells him he'd gone through this period of spiritual anguish, uh, sort of a visual pilgrimage, and finally had gone through a conversion experience. And Brainerd, reticently at first, but gradually becomes convinced that in fact, yes, Tatami has gone through a significant conversion experience. And this all happens during the year that Brainerd spends at the Forks of the Delaware. Now, Brainerd became quite interested in wanting to extend his ministry to larger numbers of Indians living further into the interior of Pennsylvania. And so he made the decision to take more than one trip into the Susquehanna River Valley, where he visited towns, Indian towns, by the names of Shimokin and Juniata and others, where he encountered not only much larger groups of Indians, but Indians who were very much living in places that were much more under the control of Indians rather than under the control of English colonists. He is going to encounter lots of Indian ceremonies, festivals, dances that are going to uh, be radically different from anything he's seen before. And so later in October of 1744, he takes his first trip west to the Susquehanna uh, River region. On this trip, he took a couple of people with him, uh, his interpreter at that time, a guy named Moses Tatamy, uh, with him and, and one other uh, minister. And on this trip, his, uh, his horse fell and, and, and broke its leg, and he had to kill his horse, put it out of misery, and had to continue the rest of the way on foot. A uh, very difficult journey. There were no roads or anything. He would be traveling over these small Indian trails that were basically one-file trails through heavily wooded, heavily mountainous areas. Uh, very few ventured that far. That was the western uh, frontier. In the Susquehanna area, he would be coming into what are known as Iroquoian villages. And the Iroquois, of course, had these very big long houses, big barns. I mean, some of them were 300, 400, 500 feet long and 20 feet high. Uh, because Iroquois were extremely matrilineal and matrilocal, and each of these, uh, sometimes you'd find as many as five, seven, ten families living in them in little compartments, uh, each related, sisters, mothers, aunts, uh, 
Uh, and of course, uh, they also, unlike the Algonquian speakers, the Iroquois had huge palisaded villages and large populations in there. They were uh, less known uh, to, the, to the English, and uh, also what was known of them was that they were very fierce, very warlike, and many of them were anti-Christian. Uh, that would have been uh, much deeper waters to wade into, uh, and he probably had some concern going there because he probably didn't know how they would greet him. Brainerd was probably one of the first, certainly one of the first Presbyterian-style missionaries to head out into towards the Susquehanna. The Moravians had been there for a couple of years. They had just established their settlement in Bethlehem, which was not that far away from the Forks of Delaware. And there was at least one missionary couple in the village of Shemokin on the Susquehanna Valley, which was a pretty important uh, settlement for both Native American and colonial authorities. It was a place where you'd negotiate treaties. Most of the other Europeans would have been traders. There wouldn't have been a lot of other presence out there, and so it was a fairly, uh, he would have been a fairly unique figure. 1744, Friday, October the 5th. We arrived at Susquehanna River, found there 12 Indian houses. After I had saluted the king in a friendly manner, I told him my business, and that my desire was to teach them Christianity. After some consultation, the Indians gathered, and I preached to them. He had mixed results as far as being welcomed. Uh, some seemed interested in hearing from him. Some of the, uh, the leaders of these tribes seemed to even invite him into their homes and, uh, and to hear what he had to say. Others were fairly resistant. After returning to the forks of the Delaware, he continues to struggle with depression. 1744, Friday, December the 14th. Near noon went to the Indians, but knew not what to say to them, and was ashamed to look them in the face. I felt I had no power to address their consciences, and therefore had no boldness to say anything. Was much of the day in the great degree of despair at whatever doing or seeing any good in the land of the living. His uh, time at the Forks had engaged him in ups and downs. He'd gone through a real uh, struggle by early uh, 1745 in his own spiritual questioning of whether this was where God had wanted him to remain and to be. One of the real turning points in Brainerd's life and ministry is when he makes the decision to seek out other ministry opportunities with a group of Indians in southern New Jersey at a town called Crosswicksung, just uh, east of Trenton. He finds this Indian village. Uh, it was sort of surrounded by colonial settlement, but clearly a, a Delaware village. And he talks about preaching and said, well, there was only a few women um, who heard me preach. And he, his diary doesn't seem to suggest he's particularly excited, but he makes the comment in his diary that they uh, went off and told other people that I was preaching. Now, what's really important about this is that within the Delaware culture, the religious uh, leaders are men but the women are considered to be the keepers of religious uh, knowledge and religious value. And so when these women hear him preach and go off to the rest of their people and say, you need to come and hear this religious person preach, that's a very important cultural statement. Just the fact that the women accepted him, even that the men accepted him, you know, at the same rate as the women, but the women, because the tribes are matrilineal, the social networking would travel through these uh, matrilineages, and women would get it out to their kin and kith that uh, they liked what this guy was saying and come and listen. And if they liked it, then they would stay because they were, they're searching for, for uh, something positive because so much bad things are happening to Native peoples at this time. Brainerd never understands this. And then within a week or so of him preaching, it's, uh, you know, they're looking for food and he's worried that they're all going to go off hunting, he's going to lose his audience. And they kill a number of deer uh, close by, which means they can feed themselves for several weeks and there's no need to go hunting. And so he, he keeps his audience longer than he would have expected. Of course, Brainerd sees this as the hand of God. Probably Brainerd is preaching in the way he'd preached during the revival meetings, which would have been very animated, walking about. This also fit with Delaware culture, that spiritual values would be 
translated or presented in a very animated fashion. Again, he didn't know that he was doing this, I don't think, but he is. He's making some cultural connections, completely unaware of what he's doing. The revival begins to break out. And what he describes is basically what you would see happening in New Haven, in Northampton, in other places during the High of the Awakenings. People falling down, people bursting into tears over their sins, people going into long prayer times talking about visions from God. Uh, Tatami is uh, you know, able to translate these concepts of the Delaware, so he's not just doing a word-for-word -word translation. Brainerd describes the revival in his diary. 1745, August 8th. In the afternoon I preached to the Indians. There was much visible concern among them while I was discoursing publicly. But afterwards, when I spoke to one and another more particularly, whom I perceived under much concern, the power of God seemed to descend upon the assembly like a rushing mighty wind, and with an astonishing energy bore down all before it. I stood amazed at the influence that seized the audience almost universally. It had an impact on their marriages, had impact on uh, their debt. Uh, a lot of the uh, American Indians were in debt uh, through drinking, and all of that changed. They would not take revenge on past offenses. These were all kinds of effects that, that the gospel had among uh, those that were converted. It was profound change. As the revival continues, more Indians come in. When these new Indians turn up, they build huts or put up tents, not, not in the middle of the village, but the converted Delawares are now going to them and preaching. So a lot of these new Indians are hearing the gospel not from Brainerd, but from other Indians. And he writes this frequently that you know, he would go to bed and they would continue to have prayer meetings or they would be singing songs in their huts or they would go out and visit the new arrivals and preach them the gospel. And so I, I think what's really significant about this is this is a sort of self-replicating revival. This is not just Brainerd. He is now in a sense creating what Christians would see as disciples, people that are continuing his work. And he's effectively now functioning as a pastor to a Native American uh, settlement. Uh, it becomes, uh, there's obviously knowledge of it is spreading out because he often writes about quote unquote the white people that walk all around causing trouble. And so you get the impression that this Native American revival is sort of a tourist attraction. That local whites are turning up to see what the heck is going on. And there's a number of occasions where he preaches to both whites and Indians at the same time, which again is pretty remarkable for this period of time. But there's no doubt that Brainerd developed tremendous affection for the members of his congregation, especially those in Crosswick Sing, where he uh, recorded many times very um, personal and intimate conversations and encounters with them in their homes. And a, a key element of his ministry was to go into homes and talk one-on-one -on -one with these uh, congregants. I think there's, there's no getting around the fact that Brainerd and his own emotional well-being was very much connected to these native peoples. Word of his success began to spread. His public diary is going to be a means through which he can spread the word. The very way in which he constructs that account is going to be important. It's going to describe the revival very much as a Jonathan Edwards had described the revival in Northampton. And so it's less an account of a missionary successfully evangelizing Indians and more an account of a congregation, in this case a congregation of native peoples, having a true revival. What is happening for Brainerd in New Jersey in many ways is part of a wider movement. One of them was among the Narragansetts in 1742. Um, a large number, over a hundred uh, Narragansetts also uh, begin to affiliate with Christianity and they join a church, they form a, a church, a native church, and eventually have a native minister there as well. On Long Island, the Montaukets and Shinnecocks also um, begin to form a local uh, native indigenous church in parts of Connecticut, the Mohegans, uh, the Niantics, and the Pequots um, also form a small native-run and native-led churches. And so there's a sense in which the 1740s is the beginning, not exclusively or not definitively, but in some of these regions, it is the beginning of what people refer to as uh, 
uh, an indigenous Christianity whereby natives themselves are appropriating Christian ideas and uh, idioms and practices and then making them their own in part by having their own church structures and by having their own native ministers and so forth. Brenner decides that uh, since God is working, it would be a good time to go back out to Susquehanna again. But he does something that I think, again, is really significant because he takes a number of uh, the Delaware converts with him. But there's also clearly changes going on in his life because at one point in the journey, uh, he separates from the Delawares. Don't really know why, that doesn't do anything terrible, but he stays with some settlers. And the settlers clearly weren't very religious. Uh, he spends a couple of nights with them on the road. And he meets up again with his with his Delaware converts, and he writes that it's it's so good to be back amongst my people again. And so what's happened by this point in time is that he feels increasingly uncomfortable around non-religious white people and more comfortable around religious Indians. Now, there's not a suggestion here. Brainerd never gets away from the superiority of European culture or, or what we'd probably see today as racism. Uh, but he's clearly making a bond with these people, that he's very comfortable with them in ways that he's not comfortable with not particularly religious white people. So anyway, he gets out to the Susquehanna to Shemokin again. It's not particularly successful. What's interesting is he has some of his Delaware converts speak to the people there. They're, in a sense, if we look at it in 20th century terms, He's the preacher, and the converts are sharing their testimony. So they're telling the story of their conversions. In the spring of 1746, he went on a, this exploratory mission to find a new home for the Christians of Crosswick Sun. And he came upon a place called Cranberry. And it was just north, uh, not too far, 20 miles or so north of Crosswick Sun. So in the late spring, early summer of 1746, uh, they moved up there. About 130 uh, people moved up to Cranberry. Brainerd becomes very, I think, very excited about what's going on at Crosswick Sun and then at, then at Cranberry where they relocate. And so what he continually points people to in these public diaries is the same signs that you would see as a sign of conversion in a European church I'm seeing in a Native American church. He very deliberately writes this narrative, and I think this is the other thing that's very interesting. A number of historians have pointed out that the revival narratives that emerged in the 1740s and 1750s have a general type, and Brainerd's description of the revival of the Native Americans effectively fits into that structure. To me, this is his way of saying, this revival is every bit as legitimate as the revival at Northampton. Brainerd made one final trip uh, to the Susquehanna and it uh, is noteworthy less for the success he might have had in terms of Indian responsiveness and, and more because of what it reveals about his worsening physical condition. In some sense, maybe it wasn't the most prudent thing to do at a time when he would have been coughing up blood and suffering from a disease for which there was very little treatment in the 18th century. What we understand about consumption looking back that it looks to be tuberculosis as we call it today. So tuberculosis is an infection carried by a very strong bacteria that's very resistant. It takes very powerful antibiotics to kill it over a longer period of time than normal infections. And it's still a very deadly disease in our world today. Tuberculosis is an illness that primarily attacks the lungs first and mainly, but then spreads out to all of our organs, including our brain. So it can lead to significant brain effects on mood, on judgment, on psychoses and hallucinations and those kind of things, as well as the primary effects on the lungs. Probably the closest thing that people have a lot of contact with is maybe lung cancer, where cancer starts to eat at the lung, can metastasize to many different areas of the body and debilitate the rest of the body. But as it affects the lungs first, fever, chills, uh, night sweats, interference with sleep, and then as it continues to affect the lungs uh, and wears away the lining of the lungs, then you start to uh, vomit or cough up blood um, and start to feel like you're choking because you don't have that much lung power uh, to work. And so those are the symptoms that Brainerd initially complained of, of spitting up blood. That's why he was given time off from Yale. And as he talked about the significant symptoms towards the end of his life, it was really that process of feeling like he's vomiting blood all the time uh, in combination with his choking that were the significant symptoms that he had finally gets home, there's some backwards and forwards, we don't have all the details with society representatives, and they decide that they're gonna have his brother John come and, and pick up the work at, at Cranberry. John has been ordained, uh, David uh, now wants to go back to New England, uh, 
to visit people he writes in his journal, but probably also to say goodbye, realizing that he may not have much time left uh, to live. There's a farewell service. Uh, he cries, the Native Americans cry. Uh, he begins the journey back to New England. But he's so ill that he can't com continue. And so his, uh, his acquaintance and friend, Jonathan Dickinson, takes him into his home in November of 1746 in Elizabethtown. So during the, the winter, uh, the end of 1746 and early 1747, he's in the home of Jonathan Dickinson. And uh, a number of people come and visit him. By this point, uh, he's, he has a certain amount of reputation. Rainer had actually published his journal uh, in two parts, one in early 1746, covering the period through the second half of 1745, and then the second part, probably around July of 1746, had been published by a well-known publisher in Philadelphia named William Bradford. Uh, and it seems to have been fairly widely circulated. So there was certainly, uh, his work was becoming known. Now, how widespread and how many people, we can't really say but clearly people knew about it. Um, and the other way that we know that he was becoming well known was there were people in New Jersey who wanted the Indian land. And they began to gin up stories that Brainerd was creating an Indian base to launch attacks on settlers because there were thousands of Indians coming there, which there weren't. Uh, so we sort of know by his enemies too that the reputation was spreading. And it was at this very time that Jonathan Dickinson begins, he receives a charter to begin a new college, the College of New Jersey. And so it starts in 1746, that, that fall, while David Brainerd is in his home and uh, trying to uh, recuperate um, from his tuberculosis, get better. But it was also during this time that uh, classes start to meet in that early spring, that, that springtime of 1747 in Jonathan Dickinson's home while Brainerd is there. And that is the first days, the first class of what is now called Princeton University. While Brainerd was traveling back to New England and his destination was probably Boston, he came to Northampton, uh, Massachusetts, which would have been pretty close to the, the road on the way back to Boston or into Boston. Edwards by this point in time had a very was very well known, had a very good reputation. Uh, we'd already published some of his most important works. We know that Brainerd had read at least one of them. Um, Edwards and Brainerd had some acquaintance. I don't think they were particularly close friends, but uh, Edwards had preached at Yale when Brainerd was there. Uh, he had been at the appeal to clap. Uh, and the Edwards family also had a reputation for taking in travelers. Uh, in fact, when Brainerd arrived in Northampton, a friend of his, a man named Eliezer Wheelock, who would later become uh, quite famous in the colonies, was actually there being cared for by the Edwards family. He was also sick. And so much of the care for Brainerd as he was trying to recuperate, though the prospects of any full recovery were dim at this point, was given over to Jonathan's uh, daughter, Jerusha. The relationship that develops between David and Jerusha has been one of much interest through the centuries. In the 19th century, uh, evangelicals developed the notion that these two had become romantically involved. There really is no evidence for that, though it makes for a good story. Uh, at most, it would appear as though uh, Jerusha and David became friends, and she was, in fact, his caretaker. It was a very difficult season. Um, over the course of his uh, his writing, journaling life, uh, I think there were something like 22 entries of, of Brainerd longing to die. And then October of 1747, he finally dies. Uh, he is the funeral service that Edwards presides at, and he's actually then buried um, in the Northampton Cemetery. Uh, Jerusha sadly dies not long afterwards, and there's a suspicion that she may have contracted tuberculosis from nursing Brainerd. And Edwards does have her buried next to Brainerd in the cemetery, which has also sparked a great deal of speculation, but it was the family plot. When he died, he was 29 years old, young. And for a, such a young man to have lived so much, through it all, I think what impressed Edwards was his devotion to God. He had a strong communion and fellowship with God that I think when Edwards read his journal and his diary, he said this would be very beneficial 
to, uh, to the public. By the time that Brainerd died in Edward's house in 1747, Edwards was beginning a dispute with some members of his church over the issues of membership. Going back in the 1600s, to be a member of a Puritan church, you had to provide a conversion narrative that was agreed on by the minister. Until you had become a member, you couldn't take communion. This had changed in the intervening years where people had to be living a good life, uh, you know, and they could take communion. Edwards wanted to take his church back to the old version. He wanted to impose membership rules to bar people from communion. He wanted people to not just be living a decent life, but a truly converted life. And I believe that in Brainerd, he saw the exemplar of this, that Brainerd was an example of the life that was truly converted, someone who wasn't just a good person, but was living for God. And so I think he saw in Brainerd not just, oh, this is a good story, but this is the story of someone who's truly converted. This is what true conversion looks like. Maybe you're not working with Indians, but your life has radically changed. You're not just running your business and raising your family and coming to church on Sunday. Uh, and I think that this was the primary motivation for why Edwards wanted to publish the life. And also why he added to the, he shortened it up. He took out a lot of the melancholy stuff. He removed some of the references to the more radical events of the Yale days because he didn't want people being too radical. It became very widely read. It actually, this, more copies of the life of Brenner were published than all the theological works that Edwards published. And I think what happened in Northampton was people went, this is the kind of life we have to live to be a member? No, thank you very much. And probably accelerated the process that got him fired by his church in 1751 um, over this dispute over what membership was going to be. Now, those British evangelicals were also uh, impacted by the fact that John Wesley put out an edition of the life of David Brainerd as well in the 1760s. And so, in some respect, Brainerd's fame was connected to the fact that arguably the two most important and influential uh, evangelicals of the 18th century on the two sides of the Atlantic, Jonathan Edwards and John Wesley, had both found in Brainerd's life story a compelling account of Christian service and missionary dedication that they wanted to uh, make known. Edwards had presented Brainerd as how to live a good Christian life. The new versions present how to be a missionary. And so there are new rewrites of Brainerd's life, condensations of it, abridged versions, which emphasize missions, Brainerd as a missionary, and what he has to teach people uh, about how to be a missionary. And so that really emerges uh, in the, sort of around the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s in that period. Each generation has found within Brainerd perhaps a slightly different emphasis from model preacher to uh, model missionary to a uh, young student radical as uh, interpreted by uh, uh, 1960s evangelicals. Now I think some of these uh, characterizations of Brainerd probably stretch matters a bit, but they nevertheless uh, testify to his ongoing significance and importance for the evangelical community. Brainerd found true satisfaction with God. It was there that he wanted to be satisfied, not in the, even though he was oftentimes depressed, which showed his humanity, even though he battled the sickness, uh, which showed how vulnerable he was, he had an unshakable relationship with the God who saved him. <laughs>